21 Convention 2019 of Orlando, Florida. Our next speaker is a strong man, strength coach, proud patriarch of four, husband, and father figure to over two million men around the world. His mission is to make men strong again. Without further ado, please let me welcome back to the 21 Convention stage, Elliot Hulse. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning, man. Thank you. So it's my conviction that we're suffering as a culture, and we're suffering as men because of a lack of father. Actual fathers in our homes, father energy, and, uh, and all that's entailed. So before I begin my 12 commandments from my father, which they're essentially points that my father made throughout the course of my life direction that he's given me that, although at some points I may have uh, resented or ignored or didn't want to hear it from him, have all proven to be true in my experience as a father today and as a 40-year-old man and father figure to millions of men worldwide. On Wednesday, when I was preparing to come to the event, I was packing my bag and walking through my room, and my attention was drawn by a stack of tarot cards that I had sitting on my desk. It was just calling to me, so I said, huh, why don't I flip through the cards and pull one out and ask God what his intention for me this weekend is. What do you want me to deliver and give to the, to the men that will be here? And so I pulled the card, and that's what I got there. Can everybody see that? If you look a little bit closer, down at the bottom it says, dropping knowledge. <laughs> yeah, I had the same reaction. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna be dropping some knowledge. Well, it turns out that that's very different than what was meant by the story that's depicted in this picture. So before I begin, I would like to read a short story from the book that attended the Osho Transformation Tarot Cards that this drop in knowledge picture comes from, because it relates heavily to what we're going to be talking about today. Naropa was a great scholar, a great pundit, with 10,000 disciples of his own. One day he was sitting surrounded by thousands of scriptures, ancient, very ancient and rare. Suddenly he fell asleep, must have been tired, and he saw a vision. He saw a very, very old, ugly, horrible woman, a hag. Her ugliness was such that he started trembling in his sleep. It was so nauseating he wanted to escape. But where to escape? Where to go? He was caught as if hypnotized by the old hag. Her eyes were like magnets. What are you studying? Said the old woman. He said, Philosophy, religion, episiology, language, grammar, logic. The old woman asked again, do you understand them? Naropa said, of course. Yes, I understand them. The woman asked again, do you understand the word or the sense? Thousands of questions have been asked to Naropa in his life. Thousands of students always asking, inquiring, but no one had asked him this, whether he understood the word or the sense. And the woman's eyes were so penetrating, those eyes were going deep into his soul, and it was impossible for him to lie. To anybody, to anybody else, he would have said, of course I understand the sense. But to this woman, this horrible looking woman, he had to say the truth. He said, yes, I understand the words. The woman was very happy. She started dancing and laughing, and her ugliness was transformed. A subtle beauty started coming out of her being, thinking, I have made her so happy. Why not make her a little bit more happy? Naropa then said, and yes, I understand the sense. 
The woman stopped laughing, stopped dancing. She started crying and weeping, and all her ugliness was back a thousandfold more. Naropa said, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? And why were you laughing and dancing before? The woman said, I was very happy because a great scholar like you didn't lie. But now I'm crying and weeping because you've lied to me. I know, and you know, that you don't understand the sense. The vision disappeared and Naropa was transformed. He escaped from the university. He never touched another scripture again in his life. He became completely ignorant, but he understood. The woman was nobody outside, it was just a projection. It was Naropa's own being through knowledge that had become ugly. Just this much understanding that I don't understand the sense, and the ugliness was transformed immediately into the beautiful phenomenon. This vision of Naropa's is very significant. Unless you feel that knowledge is useless, you will never be in search of wisdom. You will carry the false coin, thinking that it is a real treasure. You have to become aware that knowledge is a false coin. It is not knowing. It is not understanding. At the most, it's intellectual. The word has to be understood, but the sense has been lost. I'll say that last part again. The word has been understood, but the sense lost. And so ultimately what this means is that I'm going to be spitting a whole lot of words to you, none of which is true, at least not true to you. Everything that I share with you comes from my sense. And I have to warn you, I speak with a lot of conviction. I will say that what I say is true, and I'll say it in a way to make you feel that way, because it is for me and my sense. But they're just words, they're just knowledge. So I invite you to take everything I say and apply it first before you allow it to be scripture in the 12 commandments from my father. So we'll begin. Thou shalt lift. Yes. So with each one of these commandments, I have a story and uh, a few keys. My father always had weights growing up as a kid. You know, when I was a kid, uh, he would have just random dumbbell sets set around. And I couldn't help myself but to want to do curls and stuff. And I would steal them and go in my room and I'd turn on the music and I'd pump them up. When I turned 14 years old, my dad bought us a barbell set for the basement. Now you would think, you know, most dads would that want to do great things for their kids would buy that barbell set and uh, he had my, my uncle was a personal trainer and he taught us how to lift in the basement but uh, it wasn't just for us it wasn't just for me and my brothers who play football my dad would go down in that basement at 4:30 in the morning every day and pump away at that iron and to this day my dad's 70 years old he has that same barbell set upstairs in his uh, the, the room next to his bedroom and he lifts every morning. My father abhors weakness. He can't stand seeing weakness in men. He can't stand seeing weakness in himself. And so the commandment to lift is something he lives by. I'd like to offer you just a few uh, keys to some of these so that you can apply them in your life and see how it works. Key number one to thou shalt lift is hard work. One of the things that we eschew and move away from, avoid in our world, as Tanner mentioned before, is hard work. We've got so easy. When you consciously subject yourself to resistance, because the only way strength happens is through overcoming resistance, you got to work hard. If you're going to the gym, and I'm being literal when I talk about lifting, you go to the gym and you're not working hard, you're wasting your time. Number two, thou shalt lift heavy. When I say lifting heavy, I mean you shouldn't be able to move that weight more than three to five times. Anything more than that is light. If you're not weak, if you're not strong, you're weak, one of our guys said earlier. It's got to actually be heavy. Now, of course, there's got to be proper form, and for proper form to be established, there's got to be structural integrity, good posture. 
And so, of course, you wanted to move those heavy weights with uh, basic movement patterns. You should squat, deadlift, bench press, overhead press, lunge, twist, basic movements. Low volume also. Uh, strength training principles, no more than three days, maybe four days a week. So that you're working with complete intensity in those few minutes that you're attacking those weights in such a way that you need a day or two to recover. Thou shalt read. Now it's interesting and it's funny, my dad grew up in Belize and he didn't really go to school. Uh, and he didn't read very well at all, but he spouted throughout our home day in and day out. If we ever just sitting around me and my brothers doing nothing, or if we would say that infamous line, I'm bored. He says, read a book, read a book. I didn't understand, I just wanted to watch TV and I never seen him read a book. And when I did hear my dad read, it was a little slow. But he was convinced that you guys need to read. Uh, I didn't like school. I didn't like reading. But his words sunk in. And when I became about 12, 13 years old, I wanted to know more about myself. I wanted to explore. And so I was attracted to the philosophy section in the library. And that began changing my life completely. A few keys to fulfilling the command of reading. Number one, read religion or living philosophy. To me, there's nothing more important than knowing how to live, why we're living, what our purpose is, and to read in such a way that we expand our thoughts, our ideas, and our consciousness beyond the current moment. When you read living philosophy, as Ralph Waldo Emerson called it, or the scriptures of your religion, you are partaking of generations of wisdom imparted upon men through the trials, tribulations, and experience of the men that came before us. Most contemporary books are just a rehash of what has been read and experienced from ancestors. Number two, read about history and your language. I think that America is the greatest country in the world. I really do. I love America. I love being American. I'm a first generation American. My parents came from Belize. They did it the right way. They became American citizens. And they taught us to love America. They taught us to want to know the history of liberty and freedom and the opportunity that we have that no other nation was given or given today. Part of the reason why we're collapsing and struggling and suffering as a culture and as men is because we don't remember where we came from. We don't remember our history. And I'm of the opinion that much of our history has been fabricated, made up, falsified and told, told to us in a way that keeps us trapped. Dig deep, we have the internet. Find out why we're here, where we came from. Your own culture, but then the purpose of America. Read vocational books. Whatever vocation you're in, and I love that word vocation because it comes from the word voice. What are you speaking into the world, creating into the world, or what is God speaking into the world through you? That's how we know our vocation, what knowledge we're spitting to the world. Spend your time in that area. Uh, learn technical skills and knowledge, right? I mentioned religion and philosophy, but I also want to mention that uh, Joseph Campbell, somebody who was referenced many times this weekend, once me mentioned that our ancestors were very cautious to teach any man under the age of 35 wisdom literature or the secrets. And the reason why they did that was because men before, younger than the age of 35 were full of piss and vinegar, excitement and testosterone. We should be out there working, fighting, grabbing, doing, getting. 
And so by reading in the direction of your vocation, you get better at being a young warrior. Don't get too caught up in high ideals, spiritual ideas, even religion. You got to read to work. And then finally, this has been uh, eye-opening for me. I, this is the first time I'm on the stage here for the 21 convention because I'm brand new to the Manosphere. I didn't know it existed a year and a half ago. And so these days, I devour all kinds of red pill books. And I think every man should. I was interesting and different in that I married my high school girlfriend. And I never really started looking about how to pick up girls and poo and things of that nature. But because the young men started asking me questions, I had to defer to the experts that many of which you know and have spoken this weekend. And it has been amazing. Buy all the books that are back there. Learn what it is to be a man from other men because that's the only way we can do it. There are people who comment online sometimes and they'll say things like, why do you need to learn how to be a man? Or you should just know how to be a man. Or any man that needs to learn how to be a man from another man is somehow wrong or deformed or demented. What they lack is the understanding that men have always looked up to other men to show us how to be men, what was expected of men, how to live a purposeful life and to live a life of, that leaves a legacy. Big picture, beyond us, meaning before us and after us. Thou shalt read. Thou shalt stop. This is one that he used to shout in my ear all the time because I'm really impulsive. And the way he used to say it to me is, Elliot, stop, think, and then speak. I would just say things off the cuff. If I was feeling it, I'd say it. If it uh, came to my head, I would say it. I have a daughter that's like that right now. Whew. And I know, I know how tough it is. I'm like, you can't stop. You can't say that. But that's what I'm thinking. Part of what's happening here is an objectivity, becoming objective about our emotions, about the spontaneity in our body, being able to notice the spontaneous movement or the want to lash out, speak out, speak up, do something, usually from an ungrounded place, from an emotional place. And my father would always warn me. He could even see it in me because I'm his son. And I'm about to speak. He'd say, think about what you're going to say before you say it. Think about what you're going to do before you do it. So a few keys to consider with this commandment is you are not your feelings. You are not your thoughts. Allow them to come and pass through you, but don't engage right away. Stop. Take your time, think, and then act. This is a very stoic, this is a very masculine way to be. Uh, notice the movement in your body. Notice your breathing. This has been huge for me because I'm a hyperactive guy. I'm an energetic guy. I'm a spontaneous guy. And if I don't stop and catch myself, notice my breathing. Am I breathing from my chest? Am I breathing from my throat? Or am I breathing from my balls? It's going to make a tremendous difference between uh, how I'm able to express myself and, and what's received. Commandment number four. Thou shalt fast. My father grew up in Belize, and there were no supermarkets. Uh, if they didn't grow it, they didn't eat it. And oftentimes, if he didn't help, because he had 10 other brothers and sisters, and it was, it was a struggle living in Belize for him, he just didn't eat. And now, of course, you know, he's got three meals a day, lives in America, the land of plenty, but he never forgets, and he always reminds us, he says, look, if you got to go a day without eating, you'll survive. And then he would recount stories of going days without eating as a kid. And he thought nothing of it. Of course, it'd be nice to fill your belly with something, but after a while, the hunger goes away. And he would tell me about that. The hunger goes away. I find this significant for a number of reasons, number one of which is that by fasting, abstaining, 
moving away from the central gratification of constantly having to fill our bodies, we grow a certain kind of strength within. There is a certain kind of resolve, uh, objectivity as well, being able to see, hmm, hunger is coming up in my body, but I don't have to act. Most of what we call hunger is just an emotional response. It's a habit. It's something we've always done. To break a habit is very uncomfortable. Anybody who stops smoking cigarettes or uh, alcohol, you know that it, 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 it haunts you. It'll grab you in your weakest moments. Food is the same way. And I am of the conviction that food is our most subtle and insidious addiction in our society. I think there's a good reason why the masters of old, including Jesus Christ and Buddha, would go days without eating in order to receive clearer instruction from the Father. Why? Because when we're not sullied, bogged down, slowed down by the digestive process, the spirit is free. There's more energy to receive. There's a wisdom that develops through the simple act of refraining, abstaining. This is a non-doing so powerful. And then also today we found that fasting has rejuvenative effects Autophagy is a process by which your body literally breaks down its old garbage cells that often turn cancerous and rebuilds itself at a more rapid rate. If you're wanting to become new again, born again, stronger version of yourself, better than you are today, you got to tear down and destroy the old and then rebuild from that foundation. Fasting is the fastest way to make that happen. Make it a part of your lifestyle. Be it time-restricted eating or fasting for days, 24 hours a week, a week every quarter. But begin experimenting, challenging yourself. In the same way you go into the gym and you challenge yourself with resistance to the weights because you know it's going to help you grow stronger, this is that 10 times 10 because there's a metaphysical strength that accompanies it. Fasting is powerful. Thou shalt fuck! My dad's going to be 70 years old. My father is going to be 70 years old. And he has no problem reminding us, telling us, bragging about how he's boning my mom. Of course, it's not something I want to hear about, but I have to admire the man. He takes not a single pill. He, my, my father is a strong, strong man. He replaced his entire roof by himself, climbing up a ladder, carrying 80 pound pallets of uh, roofing material. He talks loud, he argues with us, and he fucks the shit out of my mom <laughs> because He's got high testosterone, and that's really what this is about. My father has high testosterone as a 70-year-old man. He has higher testosterone, I'd say, than probably more, most of the 25-year-olds that can't get boners. And it's not because my father is magical. He's not doing hormone replacement therapy. He lives by a code. My father doesn't eat shitty food. He's like a cat. He's, he disdains fast food and junk food. He, he'll, he'll look at it, and he'll make you feel bad for eating it. He'll look at it, he'll smell it, and say, that's garbage. And he'll go about. He'll only eat food that's home cooked from my mother or from a special restaurant that he loves. The reason being is because when he fills his body with, well, I've never seen him eat anything else, but he fills his body with good food, he's strong. Testosterone goes up. My father doesn't fuck with his sleep. He gets to bed on time every day. And like I said before, I remember when he used to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and lift weights because, long story short, my bedroom was in the basement when I was 14, and that's where he'd lift to so wake me up. Still does it to this day. He's going to be seven years old. He's out in the sunshine all the time. He gets home from work, and he goes right back into the, into the backyard. Of course, he's full of piss and vinegar. He's got his high testosterone, so he's digging and he's chopping and he's growing things. But the point is that he's taking in fresh air, sunshine. 
drinks water. Nothing but water. As a kid growing up, I couldn't, I didn't understand. I didn't like water. I wanted Kool-Aid. I wanted iced tea. I resented my father for all of his strength and all of his boundaries and the things that he did and told us to do. I didn't understand until I could see now that he's miles ahead of most. So I drink nothing but water as well. And that keeps me fucking. Thou shalt defy. My father is a very defiant man. It's very important to understand that defiance is supported or supports self-reliance. And the reason why my father can defy, and I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> in his job, at his job. My dad fixes cars. My father is an auto body worker, mechanic. The boss's wife came in one day and, the, and, and his son, and they had a box of donuts. And the wife is walking around with the kid, and the kid has the box of donuts, and the workers are, he's being, he's offering the donuts to the workers, the guys that are working. Well, he gets to my father, and my father, snatches the back of the donuts from the kid, jams it in the garbage can, and says, get out of here with these donuts, that's trash. <laughs> you would think he would get fired, or at least be scared, afraid. Who does that? But as Chris was mentioning before, when you're really good at what you do, you can get away with being a little tough, being a little different being a little defiant. My father defies consistently. He doesn't follow the, ru the, the rules. He abhors the rules. He doesn't follow people, because for, well, good reason, he doesn't respect most people. And he would rather not eat, not live, if he had to follow the orders of someone he doesn't respect. He'd rather not have, my father would say it all the time, I'd rather have nothing than if I have to follow and listen to this man, this weak man. Defiant and self-reliant. That's number seven. Thou shalt devote. My father's a very devoted man. He's devoted to his family, and he devotes his beauty and the work that he creates in the world to his father above. My father wasn't very close to his father, but my father always refers to the father because he knows that there's a perfect father. And he measures himself up to the perfect father every day and asks nothing less of himself. And this is a part of the reason why I think religion is good for men. An avatar, a Jesus, the sun, as Jack Donovan was speaking about yesterday. When our ancestors looked at the sun, they were looking at the perfect example. And how does the perfect example act, behave, think? What does it do? Whether it be the consistency of the literal sun or the example given by Jesus Christ, the sun. Either way, the point is to have a perfect ideal for yourself, transcending all men, especially ourselves. Because if the world revolves around ourselves and revolves around what we think is right, what we think is good, we'll be lost. Once again, men need other men to look up to. And when my, my father looks up and he devotes himself to the law of the Father above, he brings down his blessings into his family to which he is incredibly devout. I've got three brothers and sisters. He married my mom when she was a teenager. They're still together. My father knows what he wants. He knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. And he gives 100% to that. Devotion also, I'm staring away from my notes, but I'd like to come back, is important because there's a choice. And when there's a choice, there must be a sacrifice. Ed said earlier that the game always gets played, gets paid. 
There's always a sacrifice in devotion. Devotion is actually a warrior quality because it's about dropping that sword and saying no so that you can say yes to what's most important. And it's my conviction that for men, it is in our best interest to either devote ourselves to a family. Like I said, beginning this event, beginning this talk, the reason why I wanted to share this with you is because I want to see more strong fathers. This is what the world needs to repair the family. This is what the world needs to repair the nation, to re repair the world. Strong men, strong, devout fathers. If you're a man, it should be your aspiration to have a family, be fruitful and multiply. Don't let the lie of overpopulation steer you away. Devote yourself to the crop, to the garden, to the family. Or, I think, men going their own way is an okay idea. Become a monk. You give yourself to family or you give yourself to God. And if you're going to be a MGTOW monk, I tip my hat to you. Because it's better that than being in between. In between is the land of degeneracy, degenerate behavior, promiscuity, lack of meaning. Why? Just like Tanner said before, why? Why am I boning this girl? Don't put your dick in a woman that you don't want to have babies with. Thou shalt reveal. My father's completely transparent. It's almost sickening. He pisses people off wherever he goes because he will not lie. He will not bite his tongue. And in that, there's a sense of integrity because my daddy, my father, accepts his shadow. I had never met a man before that was so arrogant but yet so prideful in it, meaning I am a sinner. I am a, there's, and he always says, there's the, there's the evil side of me you don't want to see. There's that side of me that is fun. There's that side of me that's loud. There's that side of me that's loving. But there's that dark side of me that if you don't, and he would say this to us as kids, if you don't start getting your act together, you're going to have to see it. You're going to see that ugly side. Joseph Campbell said, we're not to run from our shadows, our ugly side, but instead eat our shadow. Take it in and let it nourish you. My father gains power from his shadow because he doesn't pretend like it's not there. And when people pretend like the shadow is not there, he can't stand it. It's very easy in our culture that's been so feminized to look at someone who's doing something wrong and tell them that it's okay. Everybody's different. It's all right. My father doesn't operate that way. He sees something going on wrong, he's going to tell you it's wrong. Makes no mince of his words. He reveals. Thou shalt act. Act. My father has one of these sayings, one of his favorite sayings. He's got a lot of them, but one of them is, Get up every day and work, and you'll have nothing to worry about. It doesn't matter what you do. It's the momentum that you create by getting up every day and work. Tanner nailed it on the head before when he said the sense of pride that he had from just cutting up some grass, cutting some grass in his yard. My father's constantly working, constantly gardening. And there's a difference between action and activity that I think is important to point out. Because we live in a world where we're constantly told, take action, take action, take action, take action. But I found that most of the action that men take is completely ungrounded and based in fear. And when you're moving in a frantic way, a fearful way, doing the things that you're doing from that sentiment, you're just engaged in activity. Activity is mindless. It's born out of the sense that we must do something. And it's usually fear, because of fear for the future. My father acts, 
But when he's not acting, he sleeps. One of the greatest gifts my father ever gave me was a hammock. He says, when you're not working, go lay in the hammock. And when you're ready to work again, you'll know it because you'll hop up out of the hammock and go do it. There's something magical about the freaking hammock. You know that a cat, if it's laying here, right? This cat's just sitting there. I'm a cat guy, like you, Ed. I'm a cat guy. <laughs> uh, does that make us less men? <laughs> I like kitty cats. I like pussy. So the cat is sitting there. Cats are fucking cool. They sit there. Somebody walks by, they might crack an eye. Ear might turn backwards. They ain't fucking moving. They look at you and watch you go. I like a dog. A dog can get up and chase you. That dog, that cat will just sit there nice and cool, calm, like my father in his hammock. But if you sneak up behind that cat or there's a loud noise, that cat will literally jump and touch the ceiling. Boom! All that energy stored up to act because he knew how to rest. So in action also comes resting. If you find a place in between and get lost, know that you're just steeped in activity. Thou shalt guard. My father reminds me a lot of Donald Trump. And I think that's a part of the reason why the world, at least the media, a lot of other people don't like him because he's a strong father. He's a strong father figure for the nation. And one of the very first things that Donald Trump, as a strong father figure for this American nation, does or wants to do or is doing is to guard, put up boundaries, walls. When I was a kid, I mean, when I was a kid, Donald Trump was just selling real estate in New York. But my father was all about putting up the wall, putting up the fence. Our house was the only house in the neighborhood that had high fences around it. And he would say every day that all I care about, all I'm interested in, all that matters to me and what I give myself to happens inside this fence. Sure, there are other people out there on the other side of that fence. Sure, they're important, but not to me. He made it very clear that his family came first. I take care of what's within these walls, and then I'll think about what's happening on the other side of that wall. Boundaries are very important, and that's what guard, guarding represents, because without a strong no, which is what a boundary is, a wall is, without a shield to protect himself, a warrior does not have the impetus, does not have the strength, does not have the protection to pick up his sword and say yes in the direction that he's going. There is no yes without a no, without guarding, without protection. One thing you'll notice in most mythology that bring up the story of the garden, where all kinds of beauty happens, love, creation, procreation, there's always a wall. It's always a walled garden. Because if it's not walled, animals, other people, all kinds of things can come in and destroy what's being created. This is one that took me some time to understand because we live in this world where all walls are supposed to come down. We are supposed to be vulnerable as men. Share yourself. Give yourself up. These people who say there shouldn't be a wall keeping non-American citizens, people who don't want to do it the right way, like my parents did, outside of the country through the wall, also would be the same people who probably have security systems and strong latches on their doors at home. Because it's a hypocritical way of thinking. And this is primal to our existence and our being. Jack Donovan spoke about the perimeter. Nothing good happens inside if the perimeter is not protected. Thou shalt guard, be a conservative man. Men are conservative, women are liberal, and men with, li with women's minds are liberal. To provide and protect means just this, conserve. Whoop. Thou shalt create. I love that a lot of the things that I'm saying have sort of been said 
by a lot of the speakers before. Tanner did a wonderful job speaking about creating beauty. In fact, that's one of my father's favorite sayings. Create beauty, he says. Create beauty. Be generative. I thought about this the other day, that the opposite of the word degenerate, which is what we see all around us in this crumbling, decaying culture, is generate. To generate is to generate. It's to bring life, it's to do something. Tanner's picture was a big generator, the, 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 the river. That's to create. To create is to be generate. And every king is a generate king. And the only way to be generative and the way to be creative is to have those boundaries like I spoke about before. No musician is going to play avant-garde without first learning the notes. Creation requires discipline. In fact, this is perhaps our greatest gifts as men. Because everything that comes down to us through ideas, that is spoken into us through the spirit world, is intangible. It is up to us to make, to create. Women can do it naturally and normally. They don't have to think. They just got to open their legs and take it in and then push it out. Men were given a different call. There's a different call to action for men. We are to emulate our father. Our father is a generative father, a creator, the creator. It is in our capacity, but it's also our responsibility as men to mirror that in our own lives. If there are bare walls in your home, put up paintings. I owned my first home. I just started three years ago, I owned my first home. Never owned a home before. I'm building cobblestone roads, planting bamboo. I built a shed. Things I've never done before, but it's for the first time I actually really feel like a king in my castle. Even if you just have a single room, make it beautiful. Bring beauty into the world and have children. And finally, the 12th of the 12 commandments of my father is to be. Now, one thing for sure, my father makes no apologies about himself and who he is. And he allows himself just to be in all the ugliness and beauty that he can create. And he makes no apologies. But one of the things that's associated with this that my father constantly reminds me and reminds, speaks about and to himself, and he used to say to me when I was a kid, I got something in my pocket here, was that, so for example, if I asked him, Dad, you know, uh, what are we going to do next week? Or what are we going to do next month? Or how are we going to handle this thing when it happens? He would just look at me and say, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be here next week. He lives in such a way that he understands that his life can be taken at any moment. And it reminds me, I was given this gift by a friend, this coin here with a skull on it, it says, Memento Mori. And I remember watching like TV shows and stuff where they would reenact, uh, say for example, Shakespeare or something. He's sitting at a desk working. They would always have this skull. There's a skull if you can't see this on here. And it was a reminder, a constant reminder that death is always knocking at our door. We can be, as it says on this, you can leave this life right now. A bomb could drop, a hurricane could sweep, you could walk outside, get hit by a car, you could eat something that just puts you to sleep, and you don't wake up. Allow yourself to be in every moment 100% as if it's your last. And those are the 12 commandments from my father. And it is my gift to share those with you in hopes that you too will become a strong, creative, alpha male father of your own. Thank you. Now, I have a, a workshop that's going to be happening also. I've agreed to do that at, I think, 1 or 1.30. And what I'll be speaking about uh, during my workshop is, if anybody's studied psychology, you may be familiar with uh, Freud's idea of the Oedipal Complex. And the Oedipal Complex comes from the, the, the story, I think, 
I don't know who wrote the story, some Greek dude wrote the story of Oedipus, Oedipus Rex. And Oedipus, uh, in this story, ultimately ends up killing his father and marrying his mother, unbeknownst to him. And Freud used that as a way to example, to uh, describe a, a sort of turmoil that happens within the psyche of every man. There's a resistance against the father, he says. And this longing for the material, the matter, the mother. But I had another teacher who said to me, I think Freud was wrong. And I don't think it is that men want to kill their father. It's that men want to father themselves. And that made so much sense to me. I said, yeah, I love my father. I love the father above. I don't want to kill or get rid of. But I would like to know the secrets to fathering myself, taking on that strong alpha male masculine energy and projecting it into the world to be the type of creator that he is. So during my talk, my uh, workshop, we'll be exploring the 12 commandments and we can dig deeper into how you can apply them into your own life to father yourself if you didn't have a father, if you didn't have a strong father, you didn't know your father, so that you can father yourself and grow up and be the type of man that can sire, father, and lead other men for the next generation. We lament at the decay and destruction, the degeneracy of our uh, generation. But we can't sit idly by, nor can we just fill our mind with words. We've got to understand the sense of it by applying it here first, but it doesn't stop. It is our responsibility to pass it on. And that's what we'll be talking about. I've got about 10 minutes left. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Hey, Elliot, that was, that was fantastic. Um, your father reminds me of my grandfather, who wasn't a tough old man from Belize. He was a tough old man from Norway. Yeah. Immigrated here and did it the right way, like your father. Um, said, we're speaking English in the household, and we're, we're doing all that. Very, very similar. Um, huge guy. He thought that me and my uncle and my nephews were all wasting our time in the gym, lifting weights. He thought, that's so stupid. Why aren't you out there lifting plywood, carrying drywall, building homes, doing something else, right? And I, you know, I see what he's saying. I mean, it's, it kind of goes back to like what um, Mr. Cortez was talking about and, and Tanner, where we live in a world where you don't, you don't get that experience getting strong by doing real physical work. But I do go to the gym and I look around and I see us all like doing these crazy movements, like 16 people standing in front of a mirror um, doing all this stuff. And we kind of have to do it um, just to get stronger. And uh, I wondered if you might comment on that because it's a, it's a, different, it's a different paradigm for like living, right? You have to make yourself stronger, but we're not doing it with the physical labor. You're sharpening your sword, yeah. right? Your grandfather's right. That sword needs to be used. Get that sword out the sheath and go cut something, kill something. But there's a time when that sword starts getting dull. And as that sword gets older, it gets duller faster. And so my father is a 70-year-old man, or almost 70-year-old. He wants to keep that sword sharp so that he can work. My father has no interest in retiring. <laughs> My father has no interest in not fucking his wife. My father has no interest in being anything less than the strong man that he's always been, even into his advanced age. And so what he says is when he's up there lifting that barbell, he's sharpening his sword. You're making your weapon that much more powerful. And that's why we do it. Is that helpful? Hi, Elliot. Thank you for your talk. In the third commandment you talk about, um, thou shalt stop. Um, stop. Mm -hmm. Stop. Mm -hmm. Which, if I were to paraphrase phrase it, it means um, the power of pausing or the power of um, yeah, pausing before you take any action. Um, and I noticed that my, with myself, I do these practices like meditation or yeah. awareness exercises. 
yeah, I still find myself that when I'm in a self-conscious state or nervousness, in a state of nervousness, um, I have all these racing thoughts or feelings or nervousness that I can't stop myself from thinking or feeling. And so what tip or advice do you have for me to be more in the moment and pause before I take action? Well, one of the pieces that have been helpful to me is this. Don't believe your thoughts and don't believe your feelings. There are those who might say that those are demons. It's your Satan, your daddy, speaking to you through the sensation in your body and stirring of your mind. In the East, they would say that it's the monkey chattering on your shoulder. Oftentimes, we'll see it depicted in cartoons as an angel and a demon or the devil. All of which are completely outside the realm of what is true. And what is true is stillness. All that really there is is stillness. In the Bible, it says, be still and know. To be still and know means that I don't have to, like I mentioned earlier, it's not about the words and the wisdom. I'm a very heady person, so I like the ideas. In fact, I've decided, I've decided that, oh, I entertain ideas because I have fun with them, but I'm not them. I remain objective. And like everything in nature, man, well, mankind, it's interesting, humankind is, we're the crown jewel of nature, but we are also, we're also the, the, the demons amongst nature. And it all comes from our ability to, to think and to feel and to act on our feelings, unlike you know, most animals in nature. But if you look at how nature pr pr uh, proceeds, the animal don't think too hard about what it's going to get. I can't paraphrase it properly, but in the Bible he talks about how the lilies of the field don't toil and the birds don't freak out and fret. How much more will I take care of you? I take care of all these. So the whole idea is that all of our thoughts, most of our thoughts, most of our emotions, most of the junk running through our head causing us turmoil is completely irrelevant. It's based on not what's happening here, but garbage and baggage from the past. Right? Every thought that you have is something from the past because you can't think about the future. You can't carry the future into the present, but you can. But a lot of times it's carrying the past and letting it disturb us in the present or using the past once again as ammo to project and think about what's going to happen in the future and really deter us from our true path. So long story short, don't trust your thoughts. Don't trust your feelings. See them, acknowledge them, put them in their place, ask what their meaning is, and then allow it to be revealed to you. Allow your path in the true way, the right way, to be revealed to you. Just like that cat, when it's still, it doesn't have to think, boom, it was revealed. He had to jump. You'll know when it's time to jump. Thank you. Is that helpful? Thank you. Very much. I didn't have a question. I just wanted to comment that I also think America is the best country in the world. And I think just the idea of America is the best. And I agree with what your father said, that he would rather have nothing than like have to follow somebody that he didn't respect. Yeah. And that's kind of the whole idea of America is, you know, give me liberty or give me death. Let me be free or I'll make myself free. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. So you mentioned um, thou shall read uh, as commandment number two. Mm -hmm. um, and to read philosophy and religion, mm -hmm. is there any type of like particular books? Because those are very broad categories and mm -hmm. can mean like all, all, many different things to diff many different people. Um, which books or is there like a summary? Like what would you say like is the most relevant thing to read? Like okay, so I'm gonna, here's how I'm going to approach this. One of the things that are consistent throughout all cultures uh, in the way that our ancestors initiated boys into manhood, two things happened. Separation from the world of the mother, separation from the world of matter, sensation, comfort, fe good feelings, mommy, titties, pussy, food. And then atonement with the world of the father. The word of the father, Jack Donovan used the, uh, the original word father, pather, or something like that, actually also comes from pattern. Pattern is about the blueprint. Blueprint shows you what to do. If we want to get this result, we follow this 
blueprint. All cultures shared stories, which either became what we today call religion or mythology. In these stories, there were seeds of patterns for how to be in your world. Today, because we're, it's an interesting time because we're more fractured and divided, but we're more enmeshed with one another than ever before. We've become very confused. I think that there is value, regardless of what the globalists say, I think there is value in culture, tradition, and the creed of your ancestors. I think it's good for European, Western American men to be Christian, to read the Bible, to at least try to understand the wisdom that was imparted on our ancestors to get us where we are today. There are seeds in there. If you are Muslim, then read the Quran. If you, regardless of if you're Hindu, read the Bhagavad Gita. And our ancestors of every culture and of every religion have left us the scriptures for a good reason. That's why I say it's good to begin there. Thank you. You got it, brother. That's all the time we have. Give it up one more time for Elliot Hulse. Thank you.